There are four heart valves. Um, the blood returns to the heart and enters the right atrium, shown here. From the right atrium, it goes into the right ventricle, and in order to do so, it goes across the tricuspid valve. From the right ventricle, the blood's going to go to the lungs, into the pulmonary artery, across what is known as the pulmonary valve. So the first valve is the tricuspid valve, the second valve is the pulmonary valve. After the blood goes back to uh, the lungs and returns to the heart, it enters the left atrium and goes across the mitral valve. From the mitral valve, in the left ventricle, it goes out across the aortic valve to the pulmonary artery. So the four valves of the heart are the tricuspid valve, the pulmonary valve, the mitral valve, and the aortic valve. Now, what valves do is that they open and close so that when the heart beats, the blood goes forward. Uh, if it weren't for valves, then what would happen is the heart would beat and the blood would go forward and backwards. So what valves do is they allow blood to go forward in the heart. Um, patients who develop heart valve disease may not have any symptoms at all. And that's why it's important for patients to see their primary care physicians on a regular basis. However, when patients uh, do develop symptoms, it's often signs such as shortness of breath, sometimes feeling tired. They may get chest pain, and in severe cases, patients may black out, we call that syncope, or develop heart failure. Now, there are two fundamental problems that you can have with valves, the failure to open all the way or the failure to close all the way. When a valve doesn't open all the way, we refer to that as stenosis. For example, aortic stenosis is the most common of all heart valve disease. For reasons that uh, are complex, the valve may become scarred or develop calcium, little blocks of rocks on the leaflets. So the valve has trouble opening. On the other hand, sometimes the valves are just weak and they don't close properly, so the valve prolapses and blood goes uh, backwards in the heart. Uh, most patients are familiar with the term mitral valve prolapse, and that's a, a very common disorder where the valve simply doesn't close correctly, sometimes because a portion of the valve is so weak that it even tears. Well, the most common way uh, that we know there is something going on with patients' valves is with the physical examination. Um, the old-fashioned stethoscope is as important as any diagnostic tool. We listen to the heart and we hear what we often refer to as a murmur. A murmur is just the turbulence, the sound you hear as the blood goes across a valve that isn't working well. The greatest tool of all is the echocardiogram. The echocardiogram is an ultrasound study where they take a probe and put it onto your chest, looking between your ribs, where you can see pictures of the heart valves and decide if the heart valves are working correctly or not. A very fancy type of echocardiogram is known as a transesophageal echocardiogram, or TEE. This is a probe that is put down your throat with your being sedated and uh, you don't really feel this being done, and uh, you can get really wonderful pictures of the heart. The most recent advancement, which we have at Lehigh Valley Health Network, is what is known as three-dimensional TEE, just like when you work uh, um, uh, in engineering or if you go to a movie, uh, the three-dimensional is a whole different perspective on the, the geometry of the heart and its valves. And so that is even the, uh, the latest form of echocardiography. Many, many patients with heart valve disease can be treated medically. Uh, so long as they are getting routine physical exams on a yearly basis, at least, with their primary care physician and, uh, if need be, a cardiologist, uh, they can often be treated medically for a long time. Once it gets to a point where the valve disease is actually negatively impacting the heart, for example, the heart's starting to enlarge, uh, or the patient's developing symptoms that aren't allowing to live a, a normal lifestyle. They may not be able to exercise well or they get tired or they're just having chest pain. Um, 
then um, we may need to do something uh, surgically. At Lehigh Valley Health Network, uh, we have one of the largest heart programs in the state, and uh, along with that, we have one of the largest valve centers in the state of Pennsylvania. Our valve center is very unique because we work as a team, a collaborative team of cardiologists, cardiac surgeons, vascular surgeons, nurse practitioners, uh, all working together uh, in a multidisciplinary way uh, to treat our patients so that uh, you get three, four practitioners in one when you're treated at our uh, valve center. On the surgical side of things, we're very fortunate because we have five uh, cardiac surgeons who are all board certified and exceptionally trained in all aspects of valve uh, disease, including minimally invasive approaches to heart valve surgery. Now, we work as teams for these complex procedures. It turns out that in Pennsylvania, we're very lucky because um, our cardiac surgeons are under great scrutiny. We have a report card that comes out once a year. It's known as the Pennsylvania Healthcare Cost Containment Council Report, or PHC-4. For example, in valve surgery, we have significantly lower than expected mortality rates in the state of Pennsylvania. And keep in mind, only two, maybe three centers in the entire state of Pennsylvania have that. Uh, and we actually have uh, the best results of any of them. On the horizon is a new technology known as percutaneous valve insertion or transcatheter valve insertion. Uh, this is actually a procedure where you can have a valve replaced without open surgery, without conventional open surgery. Just as certain coronary arteries can be opened with a stent, there are certain valves that can be opened with a valve placed on a stent. It's truly remarkable. Now this is a very new technology. We expect that it's going to be FDA approved in the United States in the next year to 15 months. Uh, certainly we hope by 2012. I'm a physician, and before I would have anything done to me, I would have a second opinion. Now, the nice thing about second opinions today is that you can utilize the internet to get second opinions. Of course, you have to be careful there, because not all the information on the internet is good. That's why going to sites such as the PHC4 site uh, for the Pennsylvania Healthcare Cost Containment Council report is important, because that gives a fair assessment of outcomes. But if you needed valve surgery, you might want to ask the surgeon, how many years have you been doing the procedure? How many procedures do you do? And would you mind if I get a second opinion? Quite frankly, if your surgeon doesn't want you to get a second opinion, you're probably in the wrong office. Often patients will ask, if I have valve surgery, can I have the valve repaired? Well, that is an important thing, if you can, to have your valve repaired because it's your own tissue. It turns out that the valve that's most likely to be repaired rather than replaced is the mitral valve. We make every effort to repair a mitral valve rather than replace it. Mitral valve prolapse is a very common problem that people sometimes face. They'll get palpitations and shortness of breath. Their heart may become enlarged because the valve is no longer functioning correctly, often because a portion of the valve is torn. What we can do in that situation is take out the portion of the valve that's torn and sew the remaining good portions of the valve back together again. So that is what we refer to as a valve repair. The advantage of valve repair is that it's your own tissue, it's less susceptible to further infection, and you don't need to take any blood thinners. So if you have mitral valve prolapse, you should want to be at a center where they have expertise in mitral valve repair, such as we have here at Lehigh Valley Health Network. 
Let's say your valve can't be repaired. Well, that happens, and sometimes your valve needs to be replaced. For example, the aortic valve, which is the most common valve to require heart valve surgery, almost always needs to be replaced. It's very rare that we can repair an, an aortic valve. Well, the question comes up, what type of valve replacement should I have? Should I have a metal valve or should I have a tissue valve? I must say that neither valve is perfect, but let's talk about the differences between the two valves. Um, you have a metal valve, as shown here. The white part that you see is known as the sewing cuff. That's actually where we place the sutures. The black part, shown here, is the part that opens and closes. Now, Metal valves are very easy to implant and they last basically forever. There are two downsides to the metal valve. One is you may hear it clicking. It sort of sounds like a watch maybe ticking. Uh, the other disadvantage of the metal valve is that you require lifelong blood thinner therapy known as Coumadin, which is the drug that we use these days to thin the blood. Now, Coumadin is a safe drug, but it's a blood thinner, and so you need to have your blood tested on a regular basis, and there's about a 1 to 2 percent risk of bleeding complications uh, per year if you're on Coumadin. All three of these valves are easy to implant. The nice thing about biologic valves is that they don't require Coumadin. You do not need blood thinners for a biological valve. The downside to a biological valve is that they may not last forever. So to compare the two valves, to compare the two valves, we have a metal valve. The advantage is it will last a very long time, if not forever. The disadvantage is you require a blood thinner. And maybe another disadvantage is you may hear it clicking. The biological valve has the advantage of not needing blood thinners, but it has the disadvantage of not necessarily lasting forever. No doubt the trend has been toward the biologic valves. For one thing, most patients do not want to be on blood thinners, and they trust the technology such that if they need a second procedure 15, 20 years down the road, they would rather have 15 to 20 years of carefree life, meaning not on blood thinners, and accept the possibility of needing a second operation. And also, as we mentioned, there are new technologies out there where valves may be put in with catheters and stents, such that if you have a biologic valve, maybe 20 years from now, you can have a valve placed inside a valve without needing a second open operation. So there's no doubt the trend has been more toward biological valves.